Today on the show, we talk about rogue pastors and leaders taking over your precious social accounts and publishing things that should never be shared online. to ask Brady you know what that uh line reminded me of you know you know like when you're at the movies and uh oh it's the THX oh like from yeah, my mother yeah. that's what it reminded me of I was hoping that you would join in no no I'm not doing that you did not join in no great to have you here for the fifth episode I'm much more excited to be here than Roxanne is evidently she oh today actually this morning I woke up and I realized that uh, you know, when you get those like Facebook notifications, it's like, you've been friends with X. So Roxanne and I have been friends on Facebook for 10 years. And I got the notification that I had been on Facebook for 10 years, two weeks ago. So apparently you were one of the very first friends that I ever added. And we need to show this picture because this is the first picture that I saw. You can show a bunch of the, like Roxanne and I from back in the day. But there was this one picture of like Roxanne and I was like, that's right, Roxanne. I would one day become your boss. <laughs> Never saw that happen. <laughs> <laughs> the picture was amazing because I don't know if you can tell, but like I had this giant swoop in the front and I had like spiked hair in the back. I did a lot of silly things with my hair in high school, but I think that was definitely the that pinnacle. Was, that's what you're well known for, that's for sure. <laughs> that's like the infamous haircut of Brady from back in the day. Yeah. Uh, if you have a question for Ask Brady, you can always ask it. Hashtag Ask Brady on Twitter and Instagram. Hashtag Ask Brady in the comments on YouTube and Facebook. And one thing that, you know, one of the reasons we started this show is that our audience is getting to the size where the number of questions that are coming in is getting difficult for me to answer. For the longest time, I've always answered every question, uh, almost, let's say, 98% of questions with a response personally. We're getting to the size where not only is the company doing so much, which means I have less time, but there's more people, meaning it's hard to answer these questions super, super well, especially over text. Like, I got a couple of great questions today over Twitter. And I was like, I can't give a reasonably quality response to this in 140 characters. You only have 140 characters. Make them count. Yeah, really. I mean, so, it, you know, make sure you hashtag Ask Brady. And if you send in a question and I say, hey, would you be cool if we have put this on Ask Brady? Don't feel like offended or don't feel hurt by it. Just because, especially if I like your question and want to put it on Ask Brady, that's actually a compliment because it means that more churches are having that question aside from you and... I want to answer it in like a five to 10 minute answer rather than a one paragraph, 140 character, quick little comment response in between of other stuff that I'm doing. This way I can give you a targeted, full, uh, full-minded response. Full-minded? Full-minded. All right. You never heard that? <laughs> no. Full-minded? No. How about top of mind? No. That's a thing. Top of top mind. Top of mind. Top of mind is a thing. And now that you have admitted that you did not know that was a thing, it makes me think that full minded can also be a thing. I definitely did just invent full minded, but if top of mind is a thing. Yeah, these these thoughts are top, are top of mind. I don't think so. I mean, I didn't even come up with it. I just know that's a thing. So nice try. You are not in a great mood today. No, I'm not. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Well then, let's just get to the questions so that Roxanne can just sit back and count her monies, the paycheck that she's yeah, getting. Right. Um, all right, so the first question comes from Danny. Danny asks, what's the best way to do event registration? We host all registration through Planning Center. Is it best to promote on social media and direct link to registration on Planning Center? Or host the link for Planning Center on our website and promote that on social media? Or should I be using Facebook events somehow? What about those who aren't on social media? So Danny mentioned a couple of different things that he could do. Facebook events. I <clears throat> just responded to one yesterday and joined a Facebook event, which was, I don't know, remember the last time I did that. And so, yeah, but you can do that. Have people RSVP through Facebook. You can use something like Planning Center events and send people directly to that page. You can embed something on your website. A bunch of different uh, options that Danny mentioned. Planning Center has done a really good job over the last... 24 months or so expanding what they're currently doing. Uh, the first thing that they ever did, obviously, was we're going to create 
uh, a software, software as a service, where you can plan your church's service down to the very last second. This person walk up here, these are the songs we're singing, upload the keys, upload the song music, here are the announcements. And, and they built that so well that they've expanded, and one of their apps is called Planning Center Registrations. And so you can host all of your church's registrations through Planning Center. And the nice thing is that if you're using their church database, Planning Center People, which is 100% free, that and those registrations will directly link into the individual profiles of the people in your database. So they're really building a, a great kind of holistic, ultimate, monopolized church management platform, which is great. And uh, planning center registrations is great. What I think Danny's hitting on here is the difficulty of when you have multiple different channels. And he also hit on the fact that Danny's a guy. Um, I think so. I'm going to guess by his, uh, his or her Facebook photo. It looks like it, but it's like Like if you away. were Danielle, you could go by Danny. It's true. With an I, like D-A-N-I. They're by a lake, it looks like. Wow. Definitely a guy. <laughs> I don't know. So, you know, what we want to have is one centralized place where all the event registrations can actually happen. So the way we promote it, we can promote it through different avenues, uh, different, different avenues, different avenues to make sure that we get as many people in our church. But we want to have a singular centralized place for the registrations to actually take place. And this is why we're building Nucleus coming in April, and we're so excited about it. It's the one-stop central hub for everything in your church. Event registrations, ministry signups, contact us, prayer requests, calendar, message notes, connect card, new visitors, everything all in one place. Because when you have everything in one place, that allows you to promote from different channels. So think about, like, think about, this is what most churches do. The goal, here's what I want churches to do. You have one centralized location, Canada Dry Club Soda. Ew. <sighs> this is your centralized location. And what you will then have is a bunch of different lines pointing out of it ways that you're sending people here, right? Social media, the website, live announcements, email, word of mouth, church lobby, phone numbers and emails, like one-to-one -one stuff. But it's all leading to the same central place. The problem is that most churches don't have this central place. They have all these different avenues, but then they also have different landing places. They don't have one central hub, they have multiple hubs. So now, you've got three different places. Go to our app, go to our website, talk to Sheila. Sheila. Classic. And now what you have is three different central places where you can take your next step combined with the same number of original avenues to get to those centralized places. And so now your possible options have, you know, uh, what's, what's the number? You don't times it, but you like... Multiplied? No, like when it's like, oh, you exponentially Ugh. create more options, like by three. So you need to have the one centralized place, and that way you can promote through different places. Right. But churches don't do that. They have, go to our app, go to our website, talk to Sheila, go to this phone number, go to the church lobby, and then they promote all through different places. And that's where the confusion within church happens. Nobody knows where to go. They know that there's an app. They know that there's a website. They know that they can go to the lobby. They know they can talk to Pastor Sheila, but they don't have confidence that when they go to those actual places, they're going to be able to do what they want. Because maybe Pastor Sheila can say yes and help with one thing, but the app is where you need to go for something else. Mm -hmm. You need a one location. That way your church always knows where to go and you can consistently promote through different avenues to the same place. So to answer Danny's question, if you want to use planning center registrations for all your registrations all the time, great. Just make it that centralized location. If you're going to wait till we launch Nucleus in April and you want to use that, even better. It can be your centralized place for everything. And if you want to use your website, great. You got to have one central place. So make a decision. It doesn't really matter which one you use. There are pros and cons. Make that decision internally, but choose one place. One place, people. One place, multiple avenues. Not multiple places and multiple avenues. Right. And do you, you have anything to add? No. Of course. <laughs> um, question two comes from Tessa. Tessa says, I watched the video on limiting your video announcements to three-ish announcements. Love it. My question is, 
Does anybody have other ideas on the best way to communicate events, small groups, men's, women's ministries, etc., to the people if we cut them out of the announcements? So we have this rule of thumb that says if an announcement doesn't apply to 50% or more of the congregation, that doesn't warrant a live or video announcements, a video announcement on a Sunday morning. Meaning, if the audience that you're sharing the announcement with, whether you're sharing it through video or live with the person talking from stage, if it doesn't apply to 50% or more of the people in your auditorium, don't announce it. It's a waste of time. So the question here is, what do we do with those announcements then? There are so many different channels and avenues that we can promote through. We just talked about this on the last question. You can have private Facebook groups for the men's ministry, for the women's ministry. You can have... Uh, like you can do actual like uh, text blasts through um, certain service, like we, I don't know which, oh, text to church is a great one. So you can have everybody on a text thing and then you can text all the women's ministry through that. You could have uh, a Slack thread. You could have an email newsletter that only goes out to that specific person. Really what you wanna do is find what works best for each particular ministry. So if the women, for instance, in your women's ministry kind of like tend to be older, and maybe they don't want to be checking, you know, a Slack thread or something like that. Maybe a text, uh, automatic text blast to them would be the perfect way to do that. Uh, but there are so many different other ways to do it. And this is what churches, like, this is what they have trouble with. They say, well, there are no other ways to get it out to them. We've got to do a live announcement. Live announcements are probably one of the worst ways to get information out to people. The average person is attending church one out of every two Sundays. And so getting information to people via that avenue where they actually get in their car, drive to church, listen to the announcements, hopefully retain the information, take action on it. That's actually probably one of the least effective and efficient ways of getting information out. You've got all these people that are saying, give us a Sunday morning announcement, give us a Sunday morning announcement. And I'm like, I, it, maybe, but it probably won't even do that much good. You get a private Facebook group, you get a private SMS text, you get uh, into a private Facebook, uh, sorry, private Slack thread, Slack channel, you get an email, like all of those things are probably going to get a better response than a live announcement. And if your ministry is smaller, get on the phone with people. If you've got like 10 or less, get on the phone because that's like the easiest way to leverage that. You know, as you scale, you can't go one-to-one -one with things as much, but when you're smaller like that, do the most high touch interaction that you can. Text everybody individually, email individually, call individually. Makes sense. Um, so the third question comes from Jeff. Jeff says, we are revamping our online presence soon. One question about the Facebook pages. With the young adults and youth Facebook page, is this usually overseen by one person or does each ministry oversee it themselves with guidelines decided on by leadership? If you've been part of a church for any length of time where you are in charge of the primary communications, you have been the victim of a rogue pastor or leader taking over a social media channel, an email channel, some type of communication channel, whether physical or digital, and doing something that should not have been done. We see this all the time with lead pastors. You have someone who builds a style guide, they build a brand guide, and they're like, when we post on social, it's gonna be with these colors, with these fonts, with these types of visuals, and this is the message we're gonna have. It's gonna be hopeful, it's gonna be one of invitation. It's like everything is like dialed in, and this is how we're gonna create a, cons a consistent brand look and voice. And then the lead pastor jumps in, drops like a papyrus looking like <laughs> series graphic, and it's like, don't miss this, watch my cool promo. And you're like, well, all my work has been undone in a single rogue moment. Thanks, Pastor Sheila. And so, <laughs> We all have been there and we know what it's like. So this question is coming from that place, right? So we've talked in previous Ask Brady episodes about how if you, as a ministry within church, have your own worship experience outside of Sunday morning, for instance, young adults. Young adults meet on Monday nights and they have their own worship experience. Well, if that's the case, that would warrant giving them their own Facebook page, not a Facebook group, their own Facebook page, their own Instagram account. So then who's in charge of those? Because if the communications director, social director, like social media pastor, media director, whatever the role is officially titled, if they're the ones in charge of all the regular church pages and social digital outlets, does that mean they're also in charge of all the ministry pages? This can be intimidating for people that are in that role because I mean, they're trying hard enough to get out quality content consistently 
just on the church's social outlets. Now they've got to worry about, oh, just as many for the young adults, for the youth ministry, maybe even more. It becomes intimidating, but at the same time, we don't want to give up control because what if we give it to someone who creates a totally different voice? What I would say is, just as these ministries deserve their own Facebook page and their own social accounts, their own website even, similarly, they would also warrant their own style guide, their own social director, and their own uh, person that's in charge of those communications. Now, if you as the communications director as a whole want to take care of everything, great. Take the control, say, I'm going to do it also. Make sure that if you do that, the quality of the content being published doesn't suffer. And you have to take kind of inventory and be very self-aware of your own self and be like, am I the type of person that can do this consistently while not neglecting my other responsibilities? And also, do I have the right voice for this demographic? If you are not 18 and under as a high school or middle school student, you might have significant trouble creating social and digital and online content for that demographic. You might think you can do it, but then you'll like, you know, push, post some kind of meme that says cash me outside that you think is funny, but it's completely like inappropriate and weird. And people are like, oh my gosh, you know, like, <laughs> no, please stop dabbing that we, we, you know, we're not doing that anymore. Like, you know, you can think you're going to so oh, post soldier boy. It'd be sweet. It's like, wait, that was 12 <laughs> years ago. You know? So you have to, that's where you have to be self-aware too, because you're probably the one making the decision here. So you have to honestly assess your own capabilities and your own age, your own understanding of different demographics of culture and make the decision that way. Now, let's talk about if you actually did hand it over to someone within the ministry itself. I think a great way to kind of, you know, mitigate any potential distasteful posts, posts that you wouldn't want to be associated with your church, not inappropriate stuff, just stuff that doesn't feel like that's not us, is you could oversee it and then delegate to that individual or to those individuals. And the way that you would do that is like, you're still in charge, but you're not in charge of the actual content creation and the week after week production. This way you can focus on what you're doing, delegate to someone else and kind of be a leader in that role. So what you'd wanna do is every single thing that you've done for your own online channels, meaning brand guide, visual guide, things that you, know, you want to be known for, the way that you want people to feel and the emotions that you want to elicit when people encounter your content online. Those same kind of like goals and values, teach those to the other person. Help them create a visual guide. Be like, look, if you don't like our fonts, let's try to find some different weights within the same font family. Or let's try to find something that's, you know, feels more you. And do everything you've done for your own role, but teach them. And this is how you grow, you know, as a church with what you're doing online and digitally. If you try to do it all yourself, which I would do because I'm a control freak. It's true. Let, here, here's, here's a story. Last night, it's like 10.30 p.m. I'm in bed, lights out, wife and I trying to fall asleep. And I realized, oh, it's Wednesday night. We're posting a new blog post Thursday morning. So I get up. Brittany's like, where are you going? I'm like, I have to work. She's like, ugh. <laughs> I go downstairs to our iMac, booted up, and I'm like, I have not checked the post that's going out tomorrow. And I'm like checking it, checking it. I'm like, oh, okay, this link needs to be changed. This link needs to be changed. Oh, there's a little bit of awkward spacing here. Fix it up. Takes about five minutes. Click update. I'm like, ah, it'll be good for tomorrow morning at 3 a.m. when it goes live. Now, Roxanne and our editor, our copy editor, are the ones in charge of getting all those posts ready. We got to the point where I was like, I'm just going to write, export like, you know, the, the, the byword text file over to Roxanne and our copy editor, Monica, and they'll take care of it. And... Does this mean that some mistakes have been made that I wouldn't make? Well, of course, but like dozens upon dozens of hours have been saved and I've been able to consistently post every single week based on this because we focused on what I need to focus on and they focus on what they need to focus on. Has it eliminated mistakes entirely? No, I had to get up and like do a quick check last night, but that's all five minutes one night rather than like five hours doing the editing and the prep and the WordPress and then you gotta get the images ready for Facebook and Twitter and then you gotta add in the links, and, right? So if you want to be like me, if you are like me and you wanna take control over everything, you know, that's, that, that's great. But what's gonna happen is eventually you're gonna hit a limit where the amount of stuff you're taking control of means that everything that you already are responsible for starts to take a hit on quality and consistency. 
Self-awareness is gonna allow you to know at what point that is. Maybe you have some bandwidth in your existing role now that you can take on these new ministries. Uh, but if not, you gotta make that decision, make that call. Delegate and lead in the way that you have structured your own ministry. Teach others to do the same. Great. So question four is from Jeremy Roberts. Jeremy says, would you recommend churches put sermon videos on Vimeo or on YouTube? It's a funny question because for me, someone who loves video, loves cinematography and, and film, that's really where I got my start in the world of, of church. Vimeo is very enticing because it has much friendlier compression guidelines and compression algorithms than YouTube. Jonas, the guy behind the camera, Jonas, say hi. Hey. And I struggle every single week with this. There's this weird, weird thing on iPhone 7S at least. If you watch what we post online and on YouTube, please check this for me and let me know if it happens to you. If I go into YouTube right now and watch one of our pieces of content, last week's Ask Brady, for instance, even though the lighting in here is gorgeous and everything is properly exposed, the light areas of the image, so namely this side of my face, always, always look like they're clipping, fully overexposed. I will then look at the source file and it will be stunningly beautiful. But for some reason, YouTube on iPhone 7 Plus takes that and ruins it because their compression is junk and they hate filmmakers and want to see them die. But you know what, filmmakers? We don't have anything to say about it because everyone is on YouTube. And so when it comes to, and this is where it pains me to say this, I will always prioritize audience and attention over what looks good, and what's cool. The reason being, because it doesn't matter how, look, how, how good it looks. It doesn't matter how amazing the color grading remained and the color shifts on Vimeo due to their compression algorithms were minimal, but on YouTube, they're blowing everything up. If no one's watching, it doesn't matter. And this has been a really long journey for me being able to come to this place because for the longest time, I always prioritized, let's say, perfection over publication. Meaning, until something is absolutely 100% perfect, down to the final, last word, comma, and semicolon, we're not gonna hit publish. And the reason was because I wanted everything to be perfect. And since the beginning of 2017, we've had a shift where I've been like, okay, I'm just gonna prioritize instead attention and audience over perfection. And what have we done? We've published three, four times as much content. Our audience has grown at a much faster rate. No paid advertising, just based on word of mouth because we're publishing good stuff. And yeah, are there mistakes? Absolutely. Have I been getting some more critical feedback in response because not everything is as polished? Meaning sometimes I'll say something that isn't entirely thought out, full dash-minded, you know? like. I'll make up a word or I'll say something like with lacking the per perfect amount of context or I'll say something, you know, an idea that has really been like ruminating for me and is important, but it's not fully kind of fleshed out, meaning, you know, it could kind of sound maybe insensitive or over the top or sensational or hyperbolic. Yes, 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 yes. But because we're prioritizing publishing over perfection, the good far outweigh the bad. So if you publish your videos online, yes, Go with YouTube, Jeremy Roberts. Why? Because the audience is there. We have an amazing course inside Pro Church Academy called Serve the World with YouTube. And it walks through the exact process that we use for our YouTube strategy. What you can do with YouTube is you can actually, they still have a system where you can kind of game the algorithm using the right keywords and tagging and description strategies. And you can find keywords that have a high search rate but a low actual video rates, meaning you publish a video, you use the right strategy, your videos can rank extremely high, page one, if not number one, on YouTube search results for certain keywords. You do that once a week for two years, and you'll have an unbelievable YouTube presence that adds in hundreds of new subscribers every month without trying. It works on autopilot. You can do that with YouTube. On Vimeo, your videos will look nicer. And people like me won't notice. And that's it. Your videos will look nicer, but no one's gonna see them. And so what's the goal with our churches? Well, we talked about this before. Every church mission statement can essentially be distilled down to two things. The Great Commission 
The greatest commandments, love God and love others like yourself. <laughs> love, your, love God and love your neighbor. Yeah, I think so, yeah. There are too many different like versions of that that I like started combining them and it didn't seem right. Anyway, great commission, greatest commandments, love God, love your neighbor. Every church mission statement can be distilled down to those two things. Man, for the four-year degree in theology, that was like bad. It was. Okay, anyway, let's blow past that. Um, every church mission statement can be distilled down to those two things. Well, what do those two things require? They require people. And beyond that, they require the attention of people. And so if you prioritize looks and perfection, which I have done for years, so I don't want to like sit here and pretend like you know I'm on my high horse because this has been a, a big, big mistake of my own for years. To prioritize, prioritize that over people and their attention just doesn't make sense if your mission statement is what every church's mission statement is. So yes, YouTube over Vimeo again and again and again. Sacrifice your video's beauty for people actually watching it. You have been unbelievably quiet, Roxanne, throughout this episode of Ask Brady. Do you have anything that you want to share that I haven't asked you yet? <laughs> Classic, like, end of interview question. Every last question on the Pro Church podcast is that, yeah. No, I'm good. I'm just sick, so I'm just tired. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It has been unseasonably warm north yeah. of the border here in Canada. It has been 14 degrees Celsius for like a week, Love which I it. think is like 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know. I'm thinking 50-ish. Someone can check that and post it in the comments. But if you want your question answered on Ask Brady, hashtag Ask Brady, Twitter and Instagram. Hashtag Ask Brady in the comments on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, thanks for watching. Question for you today is, have you ever fallen prey like I have to prioritizing perfection over publishing. If you're an artist or creative, you surely have had this happen once or twice or a billion times before. So feel free to share that with us in the comments below. Thanks for watching. We we'll publish a new session, a uh, new episode of Ask Brady every single Friday. So thanks for watching. We'll be back next week with a new episode. And if you have questions, get them in. You might be featured on a future episode of Ask Brady. Thanks for watching. Wow.